Hi everyone, welcome to our April episode of our KML Foundation Table Talk vlog and podcast. I'm Paul Stamiski, your estate planning counselor. And you know, I was so inspired last month talking to attorney Rob Melick about a few issues about disinheriting the government, I thought, let's bring him back. And so today we're gonna to be talking about some unique laws that were passed relatively recently that's going to affect, well, I would say just about everybody regarding RAs and retirement accounts. Stay tuned for more. Today, I welcome back attorney Rob Melick. You know, there are a lot, of, a lot of history with some of the retirement plans. I think, boy, I think IRAs started back in the 1970s. And then we got into the 401ks and the Roth IRAs and so forth. And, and people learned that they couldn't rely on pension plans. They, you know, their retirement was gonna be based on what they would get from social security and their retirement, their own personal retirement accounts. But some of the laws recently have been changed. And so I thought it's worth having an expert come and talk a little bit about that. So again, I brought Rob Melick back. Thanks for joining me again, Rob. Thanks for inviting me again, Paul. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so the laws that I'm talking about uh, were the acronym SECURE. The SECURE Act 1.0 passed in 2019 and then SECURE Act 2.0. Let's start with the SECURE Act 1.0. What exactly is that? What Secure Act 1.0 really did was it, it kind of did, it, it kind of attacked it on both sides. First of all, it did give employers more access and more ability to help provide. I mean, most people have heard of the idea of the employer match. It's a perk that a lot of these companies will offer to encourage people to kind of have some skin in the game as well. You contribute 3% of your pre-tax income to retirement, the employer will match it. So it provides incentives to those employers, particularly your smaller employers who can kind of pool those together. You know, your larger employers, they have departments that do all of that, right? Whereas smaller employers don't have that ability. So Secure Act made it easier to do that. The other thing is it did raise the age uh, of retirement uh, when you could start taking money out. So let's kind of broadly speak about how these retirement assets work. So in the previous episode, I used the example of John and Jane Doe. Easy enough, we'll, we'll stick with the Doe family here. They're both working. They're contributing money to their uh, 401ks, okay? I divide the Doe's life into a couple groups before they reach 59 and a half, between 59 and a half and what was before 70 and a half, and then 70 and a half to the end, okay? As is the same in, in all situations, prior to 59 and a half, unless there's an exemption, and there are some emergency exemptions uh, for like health crises, things like that, if you withdraw money out of the pre-tax accounts, not only do you pay tax on that money, but you pay a 10% penalty. Between 59 and a half and what was 70 and a half, and which was now up to 72 through Secure Act 1.0, there was no penalty associated with it. So if you hit 59 and a half, the penalty for the early withdrawal went away. Of course, you still pay tax on that money, okay? Over 72 after Secure Act 1.0, your start, the government starts requiring you to take it out. The logic is you've kept the money in that account tax-free long enough. We as the government are gonna start requiring you to pay tax on that money. The process there is what's called an RMD, a required minimum distribution. So Rob, this might be a rhetorical question or even a cynical question. It's my money, I've invested it. Why is the government telling me I have to take it out? Because the government is saying that we've given you the privilege of holding on to this for so long tax-free. And again, I, I, I probably say this twice a day in my practice, this is the, don't shoot the messenger, okay? I mean, I'm just telling you what the law is, right? And that's what the government says. Now, they are throwing a bit of a bone to you by extending it out longer, but I get it. I, the sentiment is not lost on me, Paul. I, I understand that as, hey, this is my money, but at the same time, I guess the flip side of that coin is the government is giving you these tax breaks with this, and they're not forever. They're going to require that you pay that tax at some point in time. So that, that would be my answer to that question. <laughs> so, and, and let me summarize and correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like the SECURE Act encouraged people to invest earlier for their retirement and then also gave them a benefit in the end that they could maybe keep that money in and let it grow a little longer as, as their life 
extended longer. Yeah, I think that's a fair summation. And, and then that kind of ties into Secure Act 2.0, right? So 2.0 did, it did different, different presidencies. Uh, Secure Act 1 was under the Trump administration. Uh, Secure Act 2 was under the Biden administration. Uh, it, it did bump the age up. It, it is now 73 from 72, and there are provisions that increase it up to 75, at least under the current legislation. Um, the other things that I want to highlight there is that there are a couple more exemptions. For instance, there is now a provision that allows up to a $5,000 penalty-free withdrawal. There's still taxes, but a penalty-free withdrawal if you're under, nine, under 59 and a half for the birth or the adoption of a child. So they, they give you a break in that regard. Ordinarily, that wouldn't have qualified as an emergency. You would have had to pay the 10% penalty on that, but they do up, allow up to $5,000 there. Uh, the other kind of new thing is that there is a sector of employees that tends to retire at an earlier age, and that is law enforcement, firefighters, EMTs, things like that, jobs that are physically demanding jobs. So the Secure Act 2.0 did change that to the age of 50 there. So again, it's another perk that you could be in that position. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who are in public service and who do things like that and who may be contemplating earlier retirement, and, and the government does allow for that uh, for that sector. So that was those are kind of the highlights of the SECURE Act 2.0. The other thing that tied into both SECURE Act 1.0 and 2.0 that is relevant to my work as an estate planning attorney is how long a beneficiary has to take the tax consequences of any inherited money. So again, going back to my example of John and Jane Doe, let's say they have a son called Junior. I hope I don't get tripped up on all these J's, but I, th I think I'll figure it out. Junior is listed as a beneficiary on the retirement asset, okay? It used to be prior to Secure Act 1.0 that he would have his lifetime to pay those taxes. That has now changed. That period is now shortened to a period of 10 years. But it does still give us a planning opportunity because we don't know what Junior's situation is going to be. In other words, if, if Jane and John do their appropriate estate planning and Junior is a minor, Junior's 14, let's say, well, we don't know what Junior's going to be. We don't know what income Junior's going to have. We don't know any of this. But as time goes on, Junior has the opportunity once he receives that money, at least under current law, which could change, of course, but at least under current law, has up to 10 years to take the provision. And what that could mean is this. Let's take two wildly disparate examples. Let's say Junior receives that money at a period of time where he's still in college. Junior has very little or no income. Maybe it makes sense to take the tax hit on that now so that there's not as much income to offset it. On the other hand, maybe on the other end of the spectrum, Junior receives it at a time where he's approaching retirement. And he knows he's not going to have much earned income. Don't pay anything early on and pay it all at the end. So it does even though it did uh, limit it from lifetime to 10 years, it does provide a planning opportunity to make sure that that money gets treated as tax efficiently as possible. Okay. I, and, and Rob, we're talking, in, in, in my mind, I know we talked about some of the others. I guess I'm thinking IRA. Are, are, the, are the rules the same then for a Roth or a 401k? Well, they are the same for a 401k. Roth is a little different because Roth, the money you put in is done on a pre-tax. You basically put the money in, and the money grows tax-free at that point in time. So again, a lot of the conversations you'd have with a financial advisor about the desirability of either of those two options. But again, when it comes to when that money has to be realized, Secure Act 2.0 indicates that it's now a 10-year period. So that relates to any pre-tax money that you receive. Because if you receive money through an inheritance in the form of, let's say, real estate or a bank account or life insurance, under most circumstances, that's tax-free. Mm -hmm. The only way that wouldn't be tax-free is if your income, I'm sorry, if your net worth at the time of death exceeded the current levels of 12.9 and 25.8 million dollars. So long as you're below those, all of those assets I just mentioned, the real estate, the life insurance, the bank accounts, those will pass tax-free anyway. If somebody inherits the IRA, and, and now because of the SECURE Act, they have to take it within 10 years. Correct. Do they take equal amounts each of 10 years? Can they, can they divide that up in different ways? They can spread it out. And that's something they would want to talk to a financial advisor about. In other words, the laws change in that area constantly. So what I would say is this, if you are going to be a beneficiary of any pre-tax money before you sign anything, talk to your financial advisor. Understand your options, understand how it could impact your current and future tax situations. Now this might apply a little bit to last month's episode, but when we talk then about some of these the accounts, the retirement accounts, the 401ks, the IRAs that are going to be affected by the, the SECURE Act rules, um, how does that apply to the general estate planning process that you're going to go through with the client? Sure. So the first thing I would look at there is to say, okay, going back to the last episode, are you charitably inclined? Mm -hmm. Do you want to leave money to charities? And if the answer is yes, then as always, SECURE Act doesn't change it. It just amplifies the importance of it. We need to make sure that we are accounting for that charitable intent through direct 
beneficiaries on the IRAs and the 401ks as opposed to a generic, I want 10% of this money to go to my church in my trust. When I see a trust that's drafted in such a way that has 10% going to the church, as I mentioned in the last episode, to me that's a red flag. Not because I don't want money going to the church, but because of the mechanism by which it is getting to the church. Usually we can do better. And the way we do better is by having it be accomplished through direct beneficiary. Whereas we list the charity or charities as beneficiaries on the IRA or 401k directly, as opposed to mentioning them in the trust. You know, and maybe I should have asked this right away, Rob, but when we're talking about the SECURE Act and we're talking the 10 years and the RMDs and everything, does that apply for my own IRA? I mean, do I have to use up my in my own IRA within 10 years? It does. No, not within 10 years. No, no, no. You're still subject. If it's your IRA, it's the one you've been putting in, then you have the RMDs at 73 right now. Mm-hmm. So you, once you hit 73, you have to take those out every year. And the penalties are, are pretty draconian if you miss it. Mm-hmm. 25% penalty of any past due, due amounts, and you still have to pay back the original amount. So, again, if you're not already working with a financial advisor and accountant, I strongly recommend that you do so so that you don't want to miss those deadlines. Missing those deadlines, there's no forgiveness by the IRS there. Uh, so make sure that if you are, if you choose not to work with a financial advisor, make sure that you follow those uh, deadlines dutifully and don't miss any of them. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Uh, so. So it doesn't apply to me. It applies to somebody who inherits my IRA. Is that everybody? Uh, no, uh, it would not be a spouse. Spouse okay. would not be subject to that. Uh, also, if it is going to a charity, they would not be subject to because they're not subject to taxation. So it would be any human beneficiary other than a spouse is what you'd be looking at there. Okay, okay. Uh, now, 2019 Secure Act 1, 2022 Secure Act 2, are we looking at a Secure Act 3.0? I mean, other, other than the provisions, because there are provisions in 2.0 that talk about extending it up to 75. Now, who knows what human mortality is going to be in 20, 30, 40 years? You know, maybe they extend it there. I mean, there was the push for Social Security a couple of years back to raise it from 65 to 66. And, you know, maybe it should even be higher than that. We don't know, right? But the, the logic there is I, I could certainly see the need for it. I mean, 10 years seems like a long period of time, but at the end of the day, it really isn't. I mean, if you have children who receive parents' IRAs and they're in their 40s or 50s when they're receiving it, they're not even at retirement by the time that 10-year period runs out. So they may extend that period out. They may shorten the period. I mean, again, from the standpoint of the government wants their money. I mean, if I could be that blunt, they do. And they want it sooner rather than later. So 10 ways was a way of of allowing that money to get to the government earlier. They could shorten that period to five years, whatever the case is. As far as I know, there's nothing on the horizon, but different administrations, different uh, congressional makeup could change all of that. You know, and, and Rob, you're going to have more experience in this than I do. I, I don't deal with a lot of people where their primary assets are in, in property, real estate, so forth. Uh, a, a lot of the people I work with, I would say their largest nest egg is their retirement plan. Right. I mean, is that is that common in your experience as well? I'd say so. I'd say real estate and the reti- and the nest egg and retirement are about the same. It, it depends. I mean, yeah, I'd say most of my clients who are in, let's say, their mid-60s typically have their house paid off, mm-hmm. right? And most people are living in houses that are worth, I don't know, I'd say between two hundred and three hundred and fifty thousand. I mean, there's obviously outliers on both sides. So having a retirement asset at over a quarter million, maybe if you aggregate them uh, between husband and wife, whatever the case is, or maybe they just have one larger one. But yeah, I'd say those are definitely the two largest assets, aside from the one asset that I call the mercurial asset, which is life insurance, right? I mean, if you have a million dollar term life insurance policy, well, sure, you're, that's going to be your largest asset. But if you outlive the term, then that goes away. So that's why it's mercurial. It changes all the time. So yeah, I, I do think that's right. But again, what I always encourage my clients to think about is due to the RMDs, uh, due to the required distributions there, the composition of your net worth right now is not necessarily going to be what it's going to be when you're in your early 80s because they start and there's two factors there right they start requiring you to take the money out and a lot of my clients will use that retire will use those retirement incomes or assets as intended to supplement their income right they'll use that you know the roof on the house collapses what are they going to use they're going to use the retirement account to pay for that so that's not an uncommon thing and, and that it'll change it you know, if, if retirement assets are here and everything else is here as time goes on you know 73 74 75 76 77 78 80 it could flip we just don't know there's a lot of factors that go into it but i would say at the time when i meet most clients yes i, I think their their retirement assets are either number one or number two as far as their uh, most valuable assets okay and and here again i know when i meet with people one of the things I'll talk about is some of the assets that might be taxable versus not taxable and, and, and preparing for that. But, but there's a, a wide variety of attitudes people have about what do I tell my children? 
Do I tell them everything? Do I tell them something? Do I tell them nothing? And my, my concern is always, if you're going to give a potentially taxable asset to your children, there might be value in educating them a little bit about that. Talk about that a little bit. I agree with that 100%. So from my perspective, as I'm sure everyone who's viewing this has heard, there's this thing called the attorney-client privilege. Mm -hmm. Ethically, I cannot share information about my clients with anybody without their consent. And that includes children. So unless the client affirmatively tells me, I want you to share this with my children, I am duty-bound not to say anything. That said, I encourage family meetings. I encourage openness. And what I found, Paul, is, and this isn't always the case, but I found it's largely generational. The older my clients, the more likely they are to keep everything secret. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's exceptions to the rules on both sides of that equation, but that's the general feeling that I found. Keeping people in the loop helps. Like you, you mentioned one example about if they're receiving pre-tax assets, that at a bare minimum, they should know to consult with a financial advisor before they do anything. I also see it in another situation where parents may choose to treat children differently in their estate plan. And to be clear, there is no such thing as birthright, okay? Just because somebody is your child does not mean you have to leave them anything. Just because someone you have multiple children doesn't mean you have to treat them equally. One thing that I would advise that I've seen in my 17 years of practice is if you're going to treat the children differently, it may be worthwhile to explain to your children why you're treating them differently especially if it's something that's not a bitter or angry thing. You know, I've had examples of clients where they'll say they put one kid through college, the other one got a scholarship. They want to give more to the one that, they, that got the scholarship because they gave the other one more during life. And those are all valid reasons. So I would argue having that conversation with your child prior to death as opposed to seeing it at death might help from a general overall, how do I feel about this standpoint? You know, and I, and I agree with you wholeheartedly, uh, uh, but I also say that I think it's the responsibility of the parents to communicate that because if they don't, and then that inheritance isn't equal, now you've created a real rift between those siblings that, you know, if they're going to be mad at somebody, be mad at you. I'm in heaven. I don't care. Right. You know, don't, I don't want to set up a situation where my children are angry at each other. That's right. And, and as, as parents, that's what we, you know, I, and I'm the, I'm the father of two boys who are 14 and 11. So I, I get a lot of acrimony between the siblings. I hope that goes away over time. But you're right. And, and certainly something like that uh, could lead to some hard feelings. You know, you were always mom and dad's favorite, you know, or even worse, you know, did you doctor this document? Did you force them to sign it? You know, any number of things can be difficult. So yes, I agree with that. To the extent there's going to be disparate treatment, have that explanation with your children. Talk to your children about it and make sure that they understand why they're doing that. Because again, it's less of a burden on that child who is being favored when it comes to the estate plan. I, I agree with that sentiment completely. Yeah. You know, when we talk about the SECURE Act 1.0 and 2.0, there are a lot of components here. I think Rob was clear in saying, you might want to talk to a financial advisor on some of those components about the investing part and even the withdrawal part. But, but I think there's also value in meeting with an attorney who's going to be able to help create an estate plan that takes all those things into account and actually is creating a plan that's going to benefit you and, and accomplish your goals. That obviously is the ultimate purpose. Rob, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, just to kind of follow up on that, if for those people who have existing estate plans, because that's what I run into quite a bit, people who have an existing plan, I say, well, I, I took care of that. It it's, it's off the bucket list. I checked it off. I know it's the right thing to do. I would strongly encourage you to have that plan reviewed by your attorney or by an attorney of your choosing. Uh, when I meet with clients who are in that situation, what I do is I look at the document from two perspectives. One is what I call legal sufficiency. And with all due humility as the lawyer, that, that's kind of my province, kind of my job. I will tell you if the documents as written are legally enforceable, and oftentimes they still are. But you know what? Laws change. <laughs> Secure Act 1.0 and 2.0 didn't exist prior to that. HIPAA didn't exist prior to the late 90s, right? There are any number of laws that could change that would cause a document that was previously legally enforceable to be now no longer legally enforceable. So that's one lens through which I view it. The second lens with which I, I view it is what I call preference sufficiency. Are the people, are the charities, the, the entities that you want making decisions for you at the time of your incapacity, receiving the assets at the time of your death? Because life events occur. I always talk about three Ds and a B. Death, divorce, disability, and birth. Those are four very common life events that will oftentimes cause people to want to update their estate planning documents. So what I do from my prospective clients who walk in my office with existing documents, Paul, is I say, here's what I'm going to do. Give me your documents and I'm going to tell the story of your estate plan. If we change nothing 
here's how it would go. And stop me when you hear something you don't like. Because once they hear something they don't like, I can note that down. We could talk about ways of improving that story. So I just, for, for those folks out there who are watching this saying, yeah, I want to watch this because I like, you know, I like what Paul talks about here, uh, but, but I don't really need to do this because I already took care of that. I would encourage you to rethink that position. I would encourage you to at least be open to the possibility that those life events may have occurred. It's not a bad idea to have an estate planning attorney review the documents just to make sure they're still what you want and need. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I do these episodes every month because I think they're informative. I think people learn from them. I think they get information that is practical for their own lives and, and for some future planning for them and, and their loved ones and possibly their favorite charities. But I also do this so you can meet some of these professionals and realize these are really people that are here to help you. They aren't here to hurt you, gouge you, take advantage of you. They're here to serve you. And so whether it's a financial advisor, a tax accountant, an estate planning attorney, I really encourage you to use the professional wisdom and experience that they have because we do this because it's your plan, it's your life, and it's your legacy. And the best way to carry out that legacy in a positive way is to make sure you have the professionals that can guide you to do it in the right way. Thank you for tuning in again. We'll look forward to seeing you next month.